Hi, I'm Andy, the Palm Springs linguist. Today, I'm gonna to spend the day at the Salton Sea while counting down six grammar distinctions that are dying off in English. Over the years in the Salton Sea, many fish have been dying off, largely due to high levels of salinity. For example, the desert pupfish, the only native species of fish that lives in the Salton Sea, is on the endangered species list. Speaking of endangered, some grammatical distinctions are dying off in the English language. While visiting the Salton Sea, I'm going to count down six grammatical distinctions that still exist in English, but are being used less and less by native speakers and are in danger of dying off completely in the future. To be clear, this countdown is for grammar distinctions that do still exist, and some people make these distinctions, but increasingly their use is on the decline, and some people are not even aware that others make these distinctions. It's relevant to bring up the distinction between prescriptivism versus descriptivism. Prescriptivism is when a specific way of using language is prescribed. A prescriptivist position is that you should follow a specific grammar rule, regardless of whether it comes naturally to you. Descriptivism ignores what the grammar rules should be and focuses on describing how native speakers actually speak the language. Some English teachers are prescriptivists because they teach grammar that students are not using naturally and tell you that you're wrong if you don't follow the taught rules. Linguists are descriptivists, and so I'm not judging whether these grammatical distinctions should be made, but rather I'm describing grammatical distinctions that I'm observing less and less. Many of these distinctions may still be in use in very formal language use, but in everyday language use, you're not likely to hear them, unless you yourself are a prescriptivist who carefully monitors and adjusts your own speech. Language use is not static. Language change is the norm. Language is constantly evolving, and these six grammatical distinctions are evidence of language change that is happening as we speak. So let's get started. The number six grammatical distinction that is dying off, fewer versus less. The distinction between fewer and less is one of countability. There are two types of nouns, count nouns and mass nouns. Count nouns are ones you can easily count. Bird is a count noun, since you can easily count birds. One bird, two birds, three birds. Sand is a mass noun, since it cannot be easily counted. You can't say one sand, two sands, three sands. That is grammatically incorrect, since sand is a mass noun. If you must count sand, you need to use a count noun in conjunction with sand. For example, you can say one grain of sand, two grains of sand, three grains of sand. Notice that the noun you're actually counting is grains not sand itself. That's because sand is a mass noun. Some words are used exclusively with count nouns, and some are used exclusively with mass nouns. For example, many is used with count nouns. How many birds? Much is used with mass nouns. How much sand? With many and much, the count and mass distinction is very much alive and well. The words fewer and less follow the same pattern. Fewer is used with count nouns. Fewer birds and less is used with mass nouns, less sand. However, native speakers are increasingly using the word less with both mass and count nouns. Think about the express line at a supermarket. It likely says 15 items or less, even though a prescriptivist English teacher would tell you that it should say 15 items or fewer. Fewer and fewer people are making the distinction between fewer and less. Or perhaps I should be saying less and less people are making the distinction between fewer and less. For more information on mass and count nouns, watch the video Grammar Induced Roadkill. The number five grammatical distinction that is dying off. Who versus whom. Grammatical case is the marking of a word such as a noun, a determiner, or an adjective to show its grammatical category. For example, case might show whether a noun is functioning as the subject or the object of a verb. Many personal pronouns in English are marked for case. We must say he works at the Salton Sea Visitor Center because he is the subject of the sentence. We 
cannot say him works at the Salton Sea Visitor Center because him is used as an object, not as a subject. This distinction between subject and object used to routinely include the interrogative pronoun who and whom. Whom is used as an object, such as in the question, whom did you meet at Bombay Beach? Because in this question, you is the subject and whom is the object. However, nowadays, unless you're trying to sound extremely formal, you're much more likely to say, who did you meet at Bombay Beach? Even though in this question, who is indeed functioning as the object. For quite some time, the interrogative pronoun who has been taking over the role of both subject and object, squeezing out whom to be used less and less. The number four grammatical distinction that is dying off, subject versus object pronouns in comparisons. Do you notice a difference in meaning between these two sentences? She likes the Salton Sea more than him, and she likes the Salton Sea more than he. A prescriptivist would tell you that these two sentences mean different things. In the sentence, she likes the Salton Sea more than he, notice that he is in the subject case, which lets you know that the end of the sentence has been omitted, implying that she likes the Salton Sea more than he does. While in she likes the Salton Sea more than him, him is in the object case, which means that this woman likes the Salton Sea more than she likes this man. Brutal, I know. However, this grammar distinction is rarely made, so you're far more likely to hear she likes the Salton Sea more than him, even if they meant she likes the Salton Sea more than he likes the Salton Sea, since most speakers no longer make this grammatical distinction. The number three grammatical distinction that is dying off each other versus one another. Each other and one another are both reciprocal pronouns. The distinction between them is that each other is used for two people, so the sentence, the kids are helping each other, would be interpreted as there being only two kids, and one another is used for more than two people. So the sentence, the kids are helping one another, would be interpreted as there being three or more kids. However, this distinction is largely ignored, rendering each other and and one another as interchangeable to most speakers. The number two grammatical distinction that is dying off lie versus lay. There are two categories of verbs, transitive and intransitive, and some verbs can be either transitive or intransitive. Transitive verbs are verbs that require an object. With a transitive verb, you do something to something. With an intransitive verb, you simply do the action. You don't do it to something. You just do it. Intransitive verbs do not have objects in their verb phrases. For example, fish are swimming. They are not swimming something. They're just swimming. Sleep is another intransitive verb. My dog is sleeping. My dog is not sleeping something. It's just sleeping. In these examples, swim and sleep are intransitive verbs. While lie and lay have the same basic meaning of placing something in a flat position, the difference is that lay is a transitive verb. You lay something down. For example, you can lay a towel on the ground. However, lie is an intransitive verb. You can lie on the ground, but you lay a towel on the ground. This transitive intransitive distinction between lay and lie is dying off. One challenge this distinction has is that if you choose lie when you should have chosen lay or vice versa, your sentence doesn't change meaning. While it is a grammatical distinction, it does not make a semantic distinction. When a grammatical distinction leads to a difference in meaning, the grammatical distinction is more likely to live on. While the previous grammatical distinctions that have been discussed are well on their way to dying off, and you hardly hear the old way, the next grammatical distinction is just taking its first steps in dying off, and you are just beginning to hear the new way. It is a perfect example of language evolving, so this one might be more of a prediction. Okay, here it goes. The number one grammatical distinction that is dying off, because versus because of. Traditionally, because is used as a conjunction, and because of is used as a preposition. For example, in the sentence, many fish have died because the salt level was rising. Because is a conjunction introducing the independent clause, the salt level was rising. In the sentence, many fish have died because of high salinity. Because of is a preposition introducing the noun phrase high salinity. However, there is a new trend of using because as a preposition without the use of of. 
For example, many fish have died because high salinity. While that may not yet be standard English, its usage is increasing. Don't be surprised if in the future, because of eventually is replaced by because. Now I want to hear from you. Which grammatical distinction do you notice is dying off? Write your thoughts in the comment section below. Discover language you were never taught in school while exploring the California desert and beyond. If you enjoyed this episode, please click like and subscribe right now to not miss any future episodes of the Palm Springs Linguist. While these grammatical distinctions are dying off, they're not dead yet. Just like the fish in the salt and sea, they still exist, but you can see the fish bones on the shore. I'm Andy, the Palm Springs linguist, and I'm not about to get in that water. So I'm gonna head back to Palm Springs so that I can be off to the pool.